Thank you for joining today on Side by Side. And I hope that you're finding this little series in Romans some help as you try to negotiate and think about your faith, because that's what Romans does for us. It, it does force us. It, tiny, it turns the gradient of our Christian thinking slightly more steep and makes us have to dig deeper in order to try to figure out. Today and tomorrow, uh, we'll be thinking a little deeper about some things, but let's go with it anyway. Get our hiking shoes on and let's pray that God will guide us for these few moments we spend each day. The idea of health is something that everybody's very, well, very concerned about and very interested in. Some have a very good pattern where they go regularly to the doctor and ask for a sort of a general medical, maybe once a year or once every two years. It's great practice highlighting anything that might have got out of kilter a little bit, overweight, blood pressure, different things that can be sort of indicating that there might be some need for a change. Some of it will be external. I'm sure that, you know, they'll be there. They'll look at you. You and I know ourselves. Uh, we can look in the mirror and we can see, or we can, we, we just look and we see certain parts or bits of us that maybe just aren't what they should be. And we say, yeah, I just think things are not good. But the other thing is that we know what's going on inside us. We know how we feel. We know a little bit about the inner being. Now, if I was to try to judge your health merely by how you look on the outside, well, you might look pale, you might look tired, but it wouldn't give me the true picture. I think that when we come to Romans, we get the real x-ray of our inner being. And that's so, so crucial. In the last few verses of chapter 2, Paul deals with this question about, you know, is there any benefit to being circumcised or circumcised and what does it mean? Verse 25 says this, The Jewish ceremony of circumcision has value only if you obey God's law. But if you don't obey God's law, you're no better off than an uncircumcised Gentile. And if Gentiles obey God's law, won't God declare them to be his own people? In fact, uncircumcised Gentiles who keep God's law will condemn you Jews who are circumcised and possess God's law, but don't obey it. That's interesting. Paul is here addressing the Jewish concerns, the Jewish question. That is one of the big, big questions in the first century as the Christian faith was moving out from its Jewish core into the Gentile world. And he's addressing these specific issues. And circumcision was a very big issue. It was a symbol of everything that was external to the Jewish community. I recall one time when I was a student having to go down to the medical centre because I had started to lose hearing in an ear. And when the, the doctor had a look at my ear, he said, you know, yes, you have a problem. You've got fungi growing on your ear. Well, when the thought of that made me think of a mushroom coming out of my ear, but I think he meant something much more minuscule. But he said, we're going to deal with this not from the outside. We're going to deal with it by putting something into you that will eventually come out in your skin. It may, it may take a little bit of time, but it will cure the problem. And that's what happened. And that was the solution. And I think that Paul here is saying, if you merely look at what's on the outside, if you merely are an external person in your faith and it has not reached your heart, and the evidence of it reaching your heart is that you gladly do the will of God, not in order to win his favour, but because you're thankful for having received his grace. Well, if, if, if your heart is not changed, you're, you're no different than anyone else, no matter how much you do on the outside. And I suspect that so many of the religions of the world are literally external, outward rituals and activities. Yes, they, those do create inner thoughts and they create feelings as well. And I know that that's true. I mean, and it may be that by spending time in certain external practices, people find a degree of help, like the mindfulness that seems so common today. This idea that, you know, we can rest our mind and various things about how we deal with our mind. The idea that's behind some of the Eastern religions, emptying the mind, the silence, the meditation, those can all have an effect on a person. They may make you feel calm and good. That's okay. But do they really deal with the deep problem of our hearts? Which is a question we'll look at tomorrow more in depth, but the question of sin and judgment. Now, take for example the Hindu explanation. 
This is merely to try harder in this present life now. Work harder now so that you may have a better, hopefully be reincarnated in a better state in the next life, in your next reincarnation. Yet, if I act outwardly in religious ways, how this, is this ever going to really affect the deep need of my heart? Here in my heart is where the real challenge is, because it's here in my heart that all of these issues go on. The heart is the, is it the control centre for our whole being. It's not your mind. It's not your hands. As the Bible says, it's out of the fullness of the heart does the mouth speak. It's in our hearts is where the desires are, are formed and shaped and where our worship centre is and everything about us core being there. Isaiah puts it well in Isaiah 29, verse 13, when he says this, These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. As another person said, Christianity is not about a morally restrained heart, but about a supernaturally changed heart. Listen to those words of Mark 7, 21 to 23. For from within... Out of the heart of man proceed the evil thoughts and fornications, thefts, murder, adultery, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, inverse slander, pride and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a person. I remember many years ago when I was in my late teens and I was beginning to think again about the Christian faith. Having been invited to uh, to attend a, a gathering of young people and have it, was really challenged by it, really challenged, but couldn't figure out everything, had questions but couldn't get answers, but came out of that and I said, you know, to a couple of my friends, do you know, guys, I think we need to be good. I mean, such sort of benign words, aren't they? And for a period of time following that, I really tried to be good. I tried to change my behaviour. I started to go to church for the first time in many, many years. I even had sort of changed the exterior of my life a little bit. I tried to stop swearing. I tried to give up some habits I had. And, you know, at the end of the day, it was just absolutely boring and miserable. That's religion, working hard, trying to feel good. Because there were times in the middle of that when I maybe felt a little better. When I came home from church, I thought, well, maybe I should feel a bit better because I've just done something good. God will be pleased with me. And it was only when I finally listened to some other young people one evening speaking about their own personal experiences of being Christians that I saw something that was very different. It wasn't about working outside. It wasn't about trying to convince God to accept them. It was about enjoying what God had done for them and having received that by faith. And I just saw this new vital life they had. And that's what really triggered for me the step to go forward and to recommit my life again and to re be refreshed in my soul by resting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, you know, that's why Paul says circumcision has to be a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. It, it's, it's got to be from within. You know, when someone says, I love you with all my heart, what do they mean or what should they mean? They should mean that something within them has so been altered that they want to be act and behave towards you in a very different way. Now, I know that's not a perfect analogy, but I know that we need our hearts to be changed inwardly, something that only God can do by his Spirit. And that's why we sometimes sing that little song, Change my heart, O Lord, make me ever new. It's a great little song. And it's possible as you listen to this that you have experienced, and I've no doubts that many of you have experienced this heart change, but maybe you, you, like me, need the regular reminder about the danger of merely living by your external, not by your heart. And I think it's something we need to apply every day to our lives, just to remind us, because there's a kind of a moralist in all of us, isn't there? We want to work hard to prove ourselves to others, to look good, when all the time what we want to do is to make Jesus look good and resting in him. But it's also possible that somebody maybe is listening to this who's just trusting in the things they do. You're working really hard that you hope God will be pleased with you. You know, you need just to, to, to listen to these words of Scripture and I trust that God will come 
gently and quietly and graciously alongside you and help you understand that he doesn't want your works because those works you're offering are tainted with with all sorts of sinful, as it were, sinful parts, you know, pride and so forth. He wants you to trust in his son. And that's really what we all need to do. He's the only one who can heal the broken life and make us new. And that's great news for us all.